when we talk about tones, um, if I orient you to uh, page five, and we just take a look, let me just talk about this a little bit. If you look on page five, you'll see some pictures of people. Uh, at the very top, uh, you'll see at 4.0, there's a tone called enthusiasm. Uh, on the right side, you see at 3.5, a tone called cheerfulness. Uh, just down a little bit from that is a tone called conservatism. On the left side, just down a really tiny bit at 2.8, is a tone called contentment, contented. Uh, down a little bit from that at 2.5 is boredom. Down a little bit further down at 2.0 is antagonism. Uh, down a little bit further on the right there, you see at 1.5, anger. 1.0 is fear. 0.5 is grief, and 0.05 is apathy. Now, these, the numbers here on the scale are arbitrary, but it is the mathematical relationship between the numbers and the corresponding emotional tones that makes this just utterly fantastic. What Mr. Hubbard discovered was that the scale itself existed that the emotions were in the progression as it's shown here and how this relates to you and your business is as follows what he found is that if a being was going to actually communicate to someone the furthest you could be apart would be one full tone like a tone being the distance between zero and one or the distance between one and 2.0 for example, a person at 1.0 is in fear. 2.0 is antagonism, 1.5 is anger. Anger is a very real tone to someone in fear. If you had a friend who was in grief, that's 0.5, like they're crying about something. Their aunt died, or they, their cat's going to die, or you get the idea, they're, they're in grief, they've suffered a loss. And you were to show up going, oh my God, don't be sad, look at the big sale Target's having. Uh, look at these pants I bought. I mean, they're fantastic. These are just amazing pants, and I only, they were $25. That's a deal. Well, you might be quite enthusiastic about it, but it's, it goes without saying that your friend would not find your communication very real. What would be real to someone in grief would be something along the fear band. Uh, for example, the most real tone to them is sympathy. You won't see it here, but it's on the uh, book, it's at point, point 0.9. Sympathy is at point 0.9. That is an extremely real tone to someone who's in grief. So we're going to talk about these different tones. The things that we've covered so far, so the furthest you can be apart and actually communicate is one full tone. The tone that will be most real to someone will be half a tone above them. Like the example I gave of the person in fear and somebody communicates to them in anger, that's a very real tone to them. A person who's in grief being communicated to by, in, in sympathy. Uh, somebody who goes around who's genuinely enthusiastic about things might find that other people aren't quite that enthusiastic sometimes. What is interesting is the more mobile that a person is on the tone scale, the better shape they're in which is to say a person who is really, really sane could be in any of the tones, but wouldn't stick in any of them. A person who's kind of crazy will be stuck in one of the lower tones. So high-toned people don't travel very far on the scale. Low-toned people move easily. I mean, high-toned people move easily. Low-toned people cannot move. So the, the lower the person is on the scale, the less mobile they are, the, the, the more they're stuck in a particular tone, a particular band of the scale. That makes sense so far. Mm -hmm. So you have mobility on the scale. Now I want to talk about actual tone versus social tone. Some people spend most of their lives wearing what would amount to a mask, if you will. Like, for example, someone who is what is commonly called passive-aggressive. Uh, that, by the way, the correct name for it is covert hostility, and it's at 1.1 on the scale. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But someone who's passive-aggressive or covertly hostile will always seem to be someplace else on the scale. 
for, for them to be effective at that, they would actually have to appear to be elsewhere on the scale. So you get people who have a social tone or a mask that they're wearing, which has literally nothing to do other than that's their social training, their background, that kind of thing. It doesn't have anything to do directly with their actual tone level. We're going to talk about how you could find the person's actual tone level. And here would be the thing. High-toned people bring low-toned people up. Low-toned people bring high-toned people down. Okay. So you have people that you know. Let's talk about people, places, experiences, different types of activities. That if you're doing those particular things, you're happier. Like if you go do that, it brings your tone up. If you're around him or you're around her, it brings your tone up. Like you're happier, you're doing better. Like, the mere, like there's some people, if you know they're coming to visit, oh my God, so-and-so's coming. It's, it's an, it's your, your, it lifts your spirit, so to speak, just the idea that they're, come, they're gonna be coming to town. There are other people that they don't even have to show up to wreck your day. Like <laughs> <laughs> the idea that they might call you is like, oh boy. Sounds like my last buyer. <laughs> well, all right. So, I'm my last buyer. Yeah, yeah, no, I got it. Yeah. Now, let's take that. So what's happening there is you're being impacted. Let's use that example. You're being impacted by a person who's lower tone than you, and you're connecting with them, and it's causing your tone to drop. Okay? Now, let's bridge <coughs> off for a moment from the tone scale and talk about success as a realtor. We'll come right back to this, but let's talk about success as a realtor. If you looked at all of the skills that could possibly matter for success as a real estate agent, and, I, and, I, and the examples I'm going to give are going to be primarily those of an agent as opposed to a broker. I happen to have a broker's license, but I'm not really in the business of recruiting agents. Like brokers are in the business of agent recruiting and retention and avoiding lawsuits. That is the primary business a broker's in. That's not the business I'm in. I'm in the business of getting and getting rid of listings. Period. That's it. We, we don't have a different business. Obviously, we're not interested in trying to get sued, but I'm not spending my time going, oh my God, what if, what if a lawyer, let, go ahead. We're, 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 list, we're listing and selling houses. That's what we do for a living. So if you look at what is the primary skill that if the agent is good at it, they will be successful in spite of what they what else they don't know. And if they're bad at it, they will be a failure regardless of how good they are at the other skills. Well, yes, yeah, communication, but you could have someone who is an effective communicator who isn't necessarily good at this skill. The skill, I mean there are a lot of you find you find agents who go into uh or ex agents who are now real estate instructors. And some of them are actually damn good speakers. But I can tell you without exception, they were failed agents. Big difference. People do not make three or four million a year in commission and go, you know, I'm just sick of this. I've got to get going. I, I've got to, no, they were burnouts. You you, they, they were literally burnouts. They couldn't take it anymore. Because the skill that is the skill, it's not a skill, it's the skill that matters the most is lead generation. You could say a close companion skill, but it's actually a different skill. A close companion skill is lead conversion. But when you hear people talk about, I want to build a big team, why? What would be the product? What would you go like? I want to have a big overhead. That looks like a good goal. I'm hoping to have a monstrous crushing overhead. What the person's actually, what, they, what they're associating is that the top agents tend to have teams. But what did that top agent have is a skill that enabled them to build the team, the correct answer would be always lead generation. The agent was so good at lead generation they couldn't handle all the leads they were generating. You get that now? They couldn't handle all the leads they were generating so they had to get people to help them handle the leads they're generating. An agent who can't over generate leads they're not building a team. They're not ever going to build. It's not, not going, they're not going to have one that matters. So it's lead generation. Well, let's connect. What is your tone level on the subject 
of lead generation. And what do you allow to influence your tone before you work on lead generation? You understand what I'm saying here? If you're high toned, when you do the thing that matters most, and I'm going to evaluate and just simply tell you lead generation very clearly matters the most, if your tone is high when you work on it, and you make sure your tone is high when you work on it, what do you suppose the result might be? Versus if you have a sort of an apathy about it, like, well, what the hell can I do about this? I can predict your result in advance. You understand? So this, this has everything to do with your tone level. If you go, if you have a high tone viewpoint toward customers, then I can predict in advance you're going to be successful with customers. If you have a low tone viewpoint toward customers, I can also make that same prediction. You're going to fail. You understand? Mm -hmm. So your tone level with regard to your business, particularly your tone level with regard to the important parts of your business, has everything to do with exactly how successful you're going to be. So I want to connect this and now here's the statement, and if you only learn one thing tonight, let it be this one. I'll come back to it a couple of times. But every, every time you actually communicate with someone, and I mean actually communicate, not going through a checkout line, how do you find everything okay? Yeah. Let's not, let's, that's not necessarily communication, <laughs> you understand? Okay? Like the fact that someone spoke doesn't mean an actual communication takes place find everything okay? They're not really asking you anything. You having a nice day? Hope you liked it. This isn't somebody, some, it's, a social, it's a social machinery or a circuit talking. But any time you actually communicate with someone, this might even be true when you communicate with an animal, like you have a dog or a cat or some pet you've been quite close to, you can communicate with the animal. But this is not because, well, the animal has quite the large vocabulary. This has nothing to do with words. You understand? It has to do with thoughts. And any time you communicate with someone, for real, you are going to knowingly or unknowingly approximate each other's emotional tone. I'm going to say that again. Any time you actually communicate with someone, you are going to knowingly or unknowingly approximate each other's emotional tone. You've probably, if you've ever studied music, seen a tuning fork. And you could take a tuning fork and you could hit it with a little rubber hammer and it'll vibrate at a certain frequency. And you can take another tuning fork and hold it up near it. It will vibrate at exactly the same frequency. Because an energy is going from one to the other and it works just that way with people. That makes sense so far. Yeah. Now, so we get into then what any time you communicate with someone, you're going to knowingly or unknowingly match their tone. So let's say you have a child who's having a temper tantrum. Some adults are actually capable, not all, some adults are actually capable of handling the child and staying in communication with the child without also having a temper tantrum. <laughs> you see this. And some aren't. The kid's having a temper tantrum, so the adult, no matter what tone they were in, now need to be in sort of an <laughs> themselves. It's rather remarkable. But do you see how that would work? So there's a difference, like the fact that someone else is upset or in a low tone does not dictate that you would need to be in a low tone. You could knowingly match their tone. The man who started the company I was with for 33 years, John Hall. And if John ever watches this video, I guess this will just have to, I don't mean to be insulting to Mr. Mr. Hall. But this, I, I was with the company, I started in 1978. No, it was funny. John's tone was chronic, high volume boredom. You would find that on the chart at 2.5. He was in boredom on all subjects. It didn't matter what you were like. A very nice man, very pleasant guy. Uh, he had a tendency, if you were on the phone, to come over and just start talking to you. And the fact that you were on the phone with a customer, of course, meant nothing. 
because, and I had some agents thought, well, he just thinks he's so <coughs> big shot, he can just run right. He didn't think he was a big shot. He was one of the night. He does the, like, phone calls? They don't mean anything to him. You, you understand? He's just in boredom. Like, a person in boredom, it, they're not going around, like, try to have an argument with them. You can't. You don't like the, they, 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 you say something they disagree with. They won't care. They don't care at all. I've seen people who like to debate talk to some board. It's frustrating to them. He or she won't. They won't. They won't talk to me. No, because you want to have an argument. They, they're not going to argue about anything. That's antagonism. Low volume antagonism. Oh, they love to argue. Nice day. Not that nice. It's a good movie. I, I've seen better. Uh, you, you understand? Lawyers are trained to do this. You make a point. They a counterpoint. See. It's kind of a low volume antagonism. So each tone level has high and low volume. High volume grief, pretty easy to spot. Low volume grief, simple sadness. Person sad about it. Just that's it. But the tone level, the emotional response is grief. High volume fear, terror. Low volume worry. Will it or won't it? Will it or won't it? Will it or won't it? Yes or no? Yes or no? They're worried all the time. That's fear. That's the emotion of fear. So you get high volume antagonism. You get people, I don't know, warlike things happening. But at the lower level, you just get people who want to, want to argue. You're wrong. I, I disagree. It's not that way. So you see, you have volume levels for the tones. But the important part here, the really important part, is to recognize that your tone is being influenced by the environment around you and you can do something about it like if there's a message here it's that you don't have to go into agreement with lower tones you can recognize them you could knowingly spot what's going on see some people have the viewpoint that the environment is responsible for their tone level you understand what I just said if somebody has this effect viewpoint, that's kind of a low tone viewpoint by itself, by the way, that the environment is like something other than them is responsible for how they feel or what they're doing. Like I said, I was mad at his wife. She burnt the toast. Oh my God, you bitch. Blah, 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 blah. Really? How about the event occurred, the toast got burnt, and oh, it was the last bread. So what? Seriously. Mm -hmm. A person has a choice as to how they're going to respond to any situation. There are situations that happen. You go, you can't control them. I agree, you can't control them. Crap happens. Is that a victim, by the way? What victim? What you're talking about? Well, victim, you could have somebody being a victim. Victim here is actually a tone level where the person's chronically stuck in victim. But you have people walking around in anything, that, that would be where their tone is. You have people walking around that regardless of what occurs, uh, it's somehow something's being done to them. Yeah. How could you do this, Kenny? There was a woman who used to work for me, and she liked people, she liked men with longer hair. And every time I would get a haircut, she never actually said, damn you, but she, every, every time I'd get my haircut, she may as well have walked over and said, how could you do this to me? She, but you understand, she didn't say that, but it was kind of a, I can't believe you keep getting your haircut every three weeks. Uh, like it was frustrating to her. But she tended to have effect viewpoints. Like she couldn't see herself as being causative. Like a high tone viewpoint would be a causative viewpoint. And you can do, you could say, well, what if you, one of the things, learning about the tone scale is in itself therapeutic because what would be emotionally therapeutic for anyone would be coming up tone. I am not talking about coming into a false four. On the tone scale, you'll see four is enthusiasm. So when I'm talking about coming up tone, I'm not talking about someone walking around with a stupid, idiotic, fake grin plastered across their face, and no matter what someone says, they're smiling as though some wonderful event just occurred. Like, my aunt's going to die. Great! But there are people that are just about that idiotic. Like they have some robotic response to almost everything. So that's not what I'm talking about. If someone is in grief, if you want to do something for them, this will sound funny at first, but when you know the tone scale, you'll see that's a fact. 
if you want to do something for them, to bring them, and what do something would equal bring them up tone, mm -hmm. you would have to get them afraid. You get that? Fear. You don't have to stick there, but you would get, if you could get them concerned about something, then get them slightly angry, you understand? Mm -hmm. You just raised them one full tone. You see children will go out playing and they'll ram into something and they'll go from enthusiasm down to grief and by the time the average adult is still trying to handle the kid, when the kid has shot through the tones in his back up and wants to, they're completely bored with any help you're trying to give them. They, they, they want to, they've got to get back out and play. They've got important work to do outside. You understand? So there's no statement here it takes a long time to pass through the tone, but they're going to pass through the tone on the way north. So anytime someone has suffered a loss to come back up, they're going to go through those tones. If you were causatively doing something, you're going to see them pass through them. If you get good enough at observing, you'll see them pass through those tones. Any question on anything I've said so far? Anything? Something you wish somebody else would ask? Okay. All right, I'll go on. I really wish you would ask a question just once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, this is fascinating. we have social tone, actual tone, and if you look at the chart on page 8 and 9, you will see, that's the one you're on, you will see the full tone scale goes from 40 <coughs> at the top down to a minus 40 at the bottom. The range of the scale, that's the full scale that a beam can be at. The section of the scale we're going to spend the bulk of the time on is the range between 0 and 4.0. And that is the beam plus body range of the scale. Now let's just start at 0, and that's about a third of the way down on the right hand side. And you'll notice the tone level for 0.0, .0 is body death. This doesn't take a lot of training to spot. <laughs> Uh, so you say, what does that mean? It means a dead body. It means literally. The body has died. That is the tone level. Death. So you have death at zero, and at four you have enthusiasm. Now we're used to talking about someone being dead or alive. We've actually been thinking those concepts, like I want to live, I don't want to die. You know, sort of the, the common denominator of all life forms is survive translate, keep the body, like continue living, continue living in that life form. There is a difference between being dead and being alive, but what you'll see here is that if any tone above zero is alive, which is a fact, then there would be a gradient scale of how alive are you. Does that make sense? Like, like living, then would be, a, you could have, a, how high, how, how alive is the person? Some people are very alive and doing quite well in life and accomplishing a lot of things. Other people are sort of dead. Like, they're not in very much motion, they're not accomplishing very much, and they're not very high tone. They have a certain dead quality to them. They haven't actually died. If you look at realtors, um, no, I mean, <laughs> well, you had, I remember, I remember years ago, uh, Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate had it on our website uh, that 13 out of 14 agents, that they were going to reverse this alarming trend. This was actually what it said. They were going to reverse this alarming trend with their fantastic training. I don't think they've been successful yet. Uh, but this is something I read on there one of their, like close to 20 years ago. They were going to stop this alarming trend that 13 out of 14 agents failed out of the business in two years. Two years later, 13 out of 14 had failed out of the business. Now, they called it an alarming trend. Uh, as far as I know, I, I, I've been in real estate 34 years, that trend existed for, I'm going to say, another 40, 50 years before I got in the business. And I'm anticipating that trend, if you will, to continue for the next 50 years at least. That's an actual number, huh? An actual number. So if you go 13, like why did they fail though? You see, why they, they, they didn't really understand why the people were failing. It was something they were calling a lack of professionalism. 
whatever the hell that's supposed to mean. I don't know how they were defining professionalism. I don't know if it's where, where you wear a suit, or you know all the little things in the buyer's inspection and response thing, and you can quote the contract backwards, or uh, you know all the rest of the laws to the point where you don't ever violate them in your sleep. I'm not sure what professionalism would mean, but I'm real clear on what it would mean for an agent to be successful. If you say, why do agents fail? Like seriously, why do agents fail? They don't, generate leads. they don't generate enough leads. They don't have any real customers to talk to. If you say, what else? I'll uh, end of the list. That'd be it. Because if an agent is good enough at lead generation, they could actually be utterly crappy and lousy, some are, at everything else and still be somewhat successful. Even if they were terrible at lead conversion. You say, well, what if they don't know how to fill out a contract? If they're good enough at lead generation, they could just hire an attorney. Uh, for uh, for 70000 a year, I'm sure you could get one fresh out of law school and go, your job is to come with me wherever I go, and any time I'm going to do anything with paperwork, I, in fact, I'm illiterate, you fix it up. You, you write. If it's a contract, you, you don't know how to write it. You don't have to even send them to school. They'll know how to write the contract. They'll know how to fill it in. So you wouldn't even have to be good at that if you were good enough at lead generation. Now, here's the, here's the good news. You go, well, lead generation must be a very complicated subject. It must be, apparently, because that's where everyone seems to fail. And the people that teach this incredibly complex subject of lead generation, by the time you're done listening to most of them, it sounds even more complex, which would tell you at once they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Anytime anybody talks about anything that makes it seem more complex, I'm not talking about finding the level of complexity to make it real to the person they're talking to, then make it simple. You understand? Sometimes that's necessary. But an expert on any subject can make the subject simple. And if they can't make the subject simple, they're not an expert. It's complex to them. They have complexity in their thinking. So you take the subject of lead generation. There are, get ready for this long list, precisely two methods of generating leads. Prospecting and marketing. End of the list. I've heard people say, I've heard people say, well, everything's marketing. No, if you're going to the bathroom, that's not marketing. <laughs> uh, if you're having lunch, that's not marketing. If you're sleeping, that's not marketing. Marketing, everything isn't marketing. Marketing is where you do something to get your customers to reach toward you. I'll say that again. Marketing is where you do something to get the customer to reach toward you. A company like Best Buy is not basing their business on prospecting. It's based on marketing. You understand? My business is based on marketing. Callaway's business is based on marketing. When Callaway started, their business was based on prospecting and then combined it with marketing. Geographic farming, which is the profile of most successful agents around the country, geographic farming could combine prospecting and marketing. You understand? You could, you could actually combine the activities there. But prospecting is where you do something to reach out to them. Like you go to them, you call them, or you show up, or you drop something off. You'd go see them. That's prospecting. So anything where you're reaching to them is prospecting. Anything where you're doing, running an ad or some kind of flyer or mailing to get them to reach to you, that would be in the category of marketing. That's it. That's, that's it. Just, that, just those two things. So it isn't, you could say, well, is it, is it a complex subject? Well, it could be because there's something to know about marketing and there's actually something to know about prospecting. If somebody does something and they think they know how to do it and then what they do doesn't work, now follow this, if somebody attempts to do something and what they attempted to do doesn't get the result they hoped it would get, and they did what they thought was the right thing, and it doesn't work, the only thing for them to conclude is they don't know how to do it, there's something they don't know, and they don't know what they don't know, so go into apathy about it, or it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You understand? Well, what's wrong with that? And they see somebody else that sort of has this knack for doing it. And most successful agents, unfortunately, 
when asked why are they success why are they successful they don't know why they're successful that's a fact and make up complete preposterous crap to explain their success that's a fact I remember when Howard Brenton uh, star power this was the premier uh, agent educational in the company in the industry and he interviewed Bob Bowen and Howard asked Bob why are you so successful Here's, here was Bob's answer this is still on tape somewhere maybe it's online I don't know Bob goes well Howard I've I've always been unique <laughs> he actually said that Howard goes well I can see that now that's so idiotic for starters if it were true why would you interview him? You understand? If it were a true statement, if that was the reason he was successful, it wasn't. But if that was the reason he was successful, what would be the value in interviewing him to share with other people, if you want to be successful, be unique? Like him, be unique. That wasn't the answer. The correct answer was, he was damn good at prospecting. But that didn't sound glamorous enough. So he said he was unique. And the person doing the interview takes that as an answer. Which, of course, now you have complete crap being disseminated even further. When I was on my way up, and I wanted to know why agents were successful, I had been going around the country, meeting every successful agent I could, talking to them, finding out, when, I wonder, like, what the hell is it? I wanted to know. I took at least six or seven top agents in Phoenix to lunch. One of them, who was ahead of me at the time, I, I'm at lunch, I remember it was at Ruth Chris Steakhouse, and I kept asking him, do you do geographic farming? No, you used to, oh yeah. Did you do HUD homes? No, but you used to, yeah. And I asked him all these questions, I was like, oh God, he's, he doesn't want to tell me. He's got secret information, and he just, isn't comfortable sharing it. It never occurred to me that someone could be at that level of success and not have a clue as to why they were successful. And I finally said, but you, there's something you do. You've, you've been doing this. What, what is it? And he takes out, this was about 20 years ago, a Palm Pilot. They were new then. He says, well, I got this. And I look at it, and I said, uh, I was like, what the hell? And I picked it out. He took it from his hand, and I, I looked up at him, I said, how long have you had it? <laughs> Ready for this? Two weeks. That's what he said, two weeks. How aggravating that must have been for you. And I said, but you've been successful for years. He goes, oh yeah. <laughs> he didn't know. He didn't know. He didn't know. And he'd been mislabeling it. He still doesn't know. I know him. He's actually still successful, and he still doesn't know why he's successful. I know why he's successful. He has a complete and total willingness to call on anyone. Let's we'll start with that. He has zero back off. This is the answer. This is the answer for the first guy I mentioned. He has no back off calling on anyone and asking him for business. There's the answer in both their cases. It's a skill. It's a skill. And it's a learned skill. And how do you get good at it? You ready for this? Yeah. You do it. And when you first do it, I'm going to tell you the secret to becoming a top-notch, terrific listing agent. There's just one method that will work. All other methods will ultimately fail. But I'm going to share this secret with you. And it's not going to cost you anything. I don't, this is, I'm not selling anything here. This isn't some deal at the end of the night. I want you to sign up for my CD set. I don't have a CD set. Uh, when these videos are done, they'll be online, they'll be for free. This is, this is a deal. This is just, here's some information that has really helped me. I want to give it to you. I want to see you success, higher level of success. So you go, what was he doing? He had a total willingness to call on anybody. How do you become a top listing agent? I went from being a nincompoop listing agent, like a mindless moron, to one of the top listing agents in the country. Now the first thing I'm going to tell you, when you see stuff like learn to list 98% of the appointments you go on, that is a complete, preposterous, total lie. 
Any agent who seriously says that is an idiot. Please feel free to quote me. No one has that kind of batting average. The only way you can actually achieve it, the most common one, is just blatantly lie and not know the numbers and invent it because it's so egotistically fabulous to have that kind of batting average. The other method is don't know how to count. That's the other way you achieve it. <laughs> and the last one is go on so few appointments and only call on people that you already know and they've promised to list it with you before you go over. That's the other method. And all of the methods are so stupid as to defy belief. I'm going to tell you that I don't do REOs. I never did REOs. We did short sales, but all of my listings are, we, go, we get in a car and we go to their house. Okay? We list in an area of about 2,000 square miles. We typically go in any given year on around 1,000 appointments a year. Sometimes more, sometimes a little less, depending on the market conditions. So far this year, our appointment to listing ratio is 47%. Prior to the, the market going wild in late 2004, if I went back for 15 years, the percent of listings to listing appointments for us was between 56 and 57%. If it got up to 60, I knew something was wrong. We were bringing crap in the door. I'm just telling you this so that when you see that, so you don't have some stupid standard that somebody's selling some idiotic, if you go in and show them these charts, oh, they're going to list with you. No, they're not. That's complete crap. There's lots and lots and lots, maybe hundreds and hundreds of people out there selling complete gibberish. You look at the top agents, and they don't use any of that stuff. I remember talking to, when you, when you learn to list, it's presentation-based selling. It's presentation-based selling where working buyers is relationship-based selling. So what do you need to know to be a successful buyer agent? You need to have an MLS key, you need a car, and not smell bad. That's the end of the list. That's it. That's what you need. And you could sit in an open house or find a buyer or somebody says, can you find me a house? Let me go see what I can do. And you can find them a house. They're not paying you. They don't care about buyer agency so much. They just care about the house. To become a successful lister is presentation-based selling. If I tell you there's 17 or 18 questions that sellers will have, and if you know how to correctly answer 17 or 18 questions, you have a fantastic listing presentation. If you do not know how to answer those questions, you have a crappy listing presentation. <coughs> That's something I can tell you for a fact. And I remember telling the guy, I was on some panel years ago, it was a Kelly Williams thing at the Glendale Library, and uh, they were giving away a free lunch to the people. Anyway, I remember that Frank Russo was there, and Joanne Calloway and me, and one other person, and this guy, uh, somebody won the lunch with me, and somebody else won the lunch with Callaway's. And the guy that won the lunch with Callaway's, he goes, God, I wish I had won the lunch with you. And I said, we'll go to lunch with him, we'll go to lunch. Don't worry about it. So he comes to about a half a dozen of my seminars. And he says, uh, I talked to Callaway's, and they said they don't have a listing presentation. They just talk to the customer. And I said, they have a listing presentation. He said, they said they don't. I said, I know they said that. They still, they have a listing presentation. He said, but they said they don't, so why do I need one? I said, because you need one, and they have one too. It's real simple. And I said, let me ask you this. Do you think there's any question, any question, that a seller could ask Joanne Calloway at the listing table that she would flinch because they asked it? He goes, no. I said, yeah, neither do I. I said, do you think there's anything that a buyer or a seller could say at the table to Joanne that would make her go, I don't know what to say? He said, no, I think she could answer any question. I said, so do I. That's a listing presentation. That's it. So how do you compile that list of 18 questions and how do you get the answers to them? There's a way to do it. Go on listing presentations. Go on listing presentations. <laughs> and if you're embarrassed to do it with people you know, drive 20 miles to an area you would never farm or go to and do it on them. Get stage time. This is not what if you don't get the listing. Get in front of people and do your presentation.
That's the answer. That is the actual answer. There is no other answer in any other system is guaranteed to fail. You do that, you will be successful. You need to go on at least 50 appointments to get your sea legs. That's the deal. That's 5-0. Agents delude themselves and they know how to list because they know how to fill out the form. And they get, they do sell 12 houses a year and four of them were listings from people that they already knew, that already liked them, already trusted them, and they think they know how to list. No, they don't. They know how to fill out the forms and take listings that are handed to them. But to go on enough presentations where you can go in and get the business, all problems in getting listings are either at the table or getting to the table. Your fundamental problem, even if you're a doofus at the table, your fundamental issue is not getting to the table enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now what's this have to do with the tone scale? Everything. What is your tone level on getting business? What is your tone level on taking listings? What is your, what is your tone level on doing this? What is your tone level when you're working on this? So if you have things, question? So if, so if you're the person you're trying to do your presentation to has a lower tone level than you, do you match them? or? to go down to their level, or do you stay up at your own tone level? Little of both. The, answer, the, the question is, what if the person you're trying to get the listing, you're trying to talk to them about, what if their tone level is lower than yours? The question is, do you match them, or stay high tone? Did I get your question correctly? Ultimately, it's that you're going to stay high tone, but do you need to knowingly match them, perhaps, to get into communication with them? Yes. You just don't want to do it by snapping with them. Like, let's say, for example, let's move it off of real estate for a second. Let's say some person called on businesses and he's selling something and he sees this guy's, uh, the, the person, the, the boss, the owner of the company is worried about shipments and this and taxes and government regulations. And the guy's in a low tone. And this, the salesperson sees that he has some sign on the wall that he is fishing. The guy says, you like to fish. And the guy, you could see, you could see his eyes light up. Yeah, I love fishing. He talks to him about fishing for a little bit. And then after he can see the guy has visibly come up tone, he then goes, how about the box of wee widgets? Oh, yes, I've shipped them because the guy's come back up to a higher tone. You, anytime, anybody who's ever had children, raised children, is already an expert. I want to align this with something you already know. Is already an expert at taking someone and bringing them up tone. Like if, if you've ever handled someone who was upset about something and brought him up to where you cheered him up. You did that. You did that. So, you know, when somebody thinks of selling as some kind of talking people into things, like as, as though as agents we're talking people into something they don't want to go, really? Like, so if you're persuasive enough with amazing techniques, people who don't want a house will just buy a couple of them from you anyway, or people who didn't want to move will go, all right, I'll list it. Okay, I'll sell it. I mean, I guess there's people that robotic, but that's not who I'm really looking for as a customer. I, I mean, the, the real thing in the real estate business, it's, it's a different business. I mean, from, if, you, if you have, say, from an insurance background, particularly something like, say, life insurance, which is sometimes con con conceived of as creative selling. If you go out and sell as a life insurance agent, if you went out and sold a big insurance policy to someone, it doesn't mean that if you hadn't come along, they'd have bought it from someone else. But now go into the house business. For most people who are going to buy a house, not I'm talking investors now, they're going to buy one. So every time an agent sells a house, he took that deal away from some other real estate agent. Even if he says, well, yeah, but that was my brother, uh, he would have not bought from some other agent. Well, he would have if he weren't in the business. He most certainly would have if he weren't in the business. The fact that you preemptively got the business doesn't change the fact that you took it from someone. You just don't know who you took it from. Agents tend to fascinate themselves with the deal they almost had. You know, though they almost had it, and they think of those deals as the deals they lost, which is actually a low-tone viewpoint. That's a really small part of the deals they lost. If I said to a real estate agent, think about how much money you make a year, and most of them actually know, they, don't, they, they have an idea what they grossed last, that last year. They know what they grossed. 
Now tell me, well, tell me, because I'm, I'm, I'm really don't want to embarrass him, but now, now, now look at how much money could you make if you did what you know you could do, not should do, or if you had one of these, or if you lost 80 pounds or gained 15, no, just what, what you have right now at your, like, how much could you make if you did what you could do? It's usually a number at least double the number they're making. They want to talk about the deals they're losing right there. That difference. Currently, that's the amount they're currently squandering. So the ones they almost had don't matter. That's really not the big deal. So you go back to, what do you do with the guy? Well, you keep talking to them, but you might have to drop down if the person is in, you know, if they're mad about something, you don't want to try to go, well, let's say the guy's in fear, and you knew you had to get him to go through anger. You're never going to want him to get him mad at you, but it can't hurt if he's already sort of, uh, if you want to get him irritated, maybe talk about government regulations or some dean of the city services <laughs> division or zoning. They're, you know, a real pain in the ass down there at zoning. You know that. And get the guy, you understand, you could raise the person's tone by just finding some subject he'll go into agreement with that's kind of like, but not you, or, or your, what you're doing, and he can come up tone that way. And you've already done this. I mean, everyone in the room, you, you've done this many times. All I'm doing here is saying I'm giving it the right name for a talent you already have mm -hmm. and channeling it a bit. Did I get your question answered? Yeah. Good. Any others? Anything? <clears throat> trying to figure out how to word this. Okay. So I'm assuming when you when when your team goes on listing appointments, mm -hmm. you're probably judging in a manner the sellers, the people across the table from you, like. Where do they fall on here? There's got to come a certain level where you say, we get to this certain level, we're not going to try and match them, we're not going to try and right. bring them up, like we're mm -hmm. out of here. Mm -hmm. So where, where, does that, where does that kind of fall? Well, let me not make a decision for you on where it falls. Uh, I have a rule. I don't want crazy people as sellers. I don't want I like crazy people as buyers. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone, and, and here's the thing. Let's just take this and go, so right now, you don't know the names of all the tones. You don't know all the numbers. Okay? Let's just start with that. And let's pretend that you're going to go on an appointment tomorrow or the next day, and you still haven't learned all these numbers, but you know of the existence of the tone scale, mm -hmm. and you clearly know there's an up and a down. You got that part. Okay. That's all we have to have here. So you're around someone, and they make you feel better. I'm right, going to look at why, what is it, what is this mystical quality about them. They're just, you're around them and you're, you're happier. Mm -hmm. Now, is there any liability, any liability ever in taking their listing or taking them on as a buyer if they're motivated? No. No, because no, we've already established they're high-toned. Mm -hmm. You like them, they're high-toned, and they're motivated by yourself. Mm -hmm. Good. There's your customer. Now let's say there's some person that the effect they have upon you is to make you feel like crap. Okay. All right. Now, the question would be the same question. Do you want him as a customer? Say no. Well, of course not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm, just, yeah. I'm thinking though. I think I'm trying to get a little more deep into this because let's say you show up and these people are in despair or anxiety or something like that. Okay. And so you feel a certain way around them now. But what if that's not really who they are? Maybe okay. they're normally got a little higher. Okay. We have, you have, you have, you need, you okay. Let me reframe the question. Okay. And it's a great question. Thank you. So on the tones, we're getting full credit. You hear Dustin that? is you getting hear that? credit. For those of you watching this, <laughs> even years from now, if Dustin Hollandrake asked a question that was a great question. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So here's the deal. With all the tones, you have acute and chronic. Okay. So you could have a temporary tone. Let's take you take a person who's normally high toned, and they just find out that someone they love is dead. Mm -hmm. It's shocking. It's a loss. They're in grief. But that person isn't normally walking around in grief. That is not their normal tone. Yeah. Are they going to grieve for a bit? Yep. 
Was it a shocking loss? Are they upset? Yep. But is that where they live emotionally all the time? No. So if a person's just gotten bad news, are they likely to be in a lower tone? Of course they are. Of course they are. So, but we're talking, there's some, so you could say someone had a bad day. We all have them. Mm -hmm. You just didn't get enough sleep, you didn't get enough to eat, and got a little bit of bad news, and all happened, and you had a crappy day. Oh well. So, you've had days like that. You've had days and you thought you're not your normal self, really. And you say things and think things that you ordinarily would go, geez. So let's take that. So one thing, if I could help you by teaching you something that I consider vital, let's just start with this. Don't work on important stuff or make significant decisions when you're low-toned. How about that? Like, you're aware of the fact that you've had a loss. No matter what it is. We're not, I'm not trying to get into, well, why do you feel sad about it? It doesn't matter. It was a loss to you. Mm -hmm. So I'm not taking up, at this point, why would you feel bad about that? Like sometimes you see this where some guy breaks up with a girl, or the girl breaks up with a guy, and she's just in a funk and so sad, and people are friends. So well, why would you care about him? He's a jerk anyway. Yeah. But she does. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. So the fact that the friend's going, I wouldn't have dated him, but she wasn't dating him. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't the one that had the emotional attachment. Yeah. So when a person, like somebody's cat dies, you can hear about, well, if you didn't have a cat, you hear a cat died. So what? But have your cat and have it be a cat, you've invested all this emotion in, and that cat dies. Now it's like, oh my, this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. the, the person has a loss. We're not talking about why is it a loss. We're not taking that up. So if you know you feel crappy, let's just say you didn't get enough sleep, you're low on something your body needs, maybe you just you know, needed a hamburger, and you, but you get the point. You don't feel your normal, fantastic self. Is that the time to prospect? That's what I was just thinking. No smile and no. dial if you're going to fake the smile. Yeah, right? well, we'll come back to that. But, but is this the time when you feel yeah. crappy to do something important? Is this the time to decide your life plan? No. It's the time to studiously work on getting your tone level up. Then you can do that. So let's so let's say you go to a house, okay, and you're on a listing appointment, and the seller is just angry. Okay. At that point, uh, is this, I'm, here's what I'm wondering: Is this person an angry person? Yep. Or is he angry right now? So Excellent we'll, question. So, like, what do you do? Say, change subjects. Um, change, change it. Change subjects two, three, four, five, six times, and you'll find some people it won't matter what you change the subject to. They're still madder than hell. And that's the ones you avoid. Uh, we're done. Yeah, we're done. They're crazy. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're not institutionalized doesn't mean they're not crazy. <laughs> uh, they're, 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 they don't qualify to be one of our customers. Nice. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. I like that standard. Because I know you list a lot of short sales, mm -hmm. and I'm just assuming that when you go into a short sale listing, you you probably are catching people very low, like feeling hopeless, mm -hmm. useless, a victim. So how do you work with with that so that you know you're actually helping them? Well, we're not trying to do grief counseling, right? But. Do people get upset? They most certainly do. Uh, is it a loss for them? It most certainly is. There, if they have shame connected with, they haven't made their mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the loss of the house itself, or the loss of their standing, or the loss of their credit, or just there's, it's a loss. So are they upset? Yes, but this doesn't make them bad people. Like the fact that someone who's a nice, decent person is suffering a loss is not some reason we wouldn't take them on as a customer. Mm. I mean, period. It, it just, but where you have this is this is different than, than than his question of if you have someone who's just sort of nutty. Like if you see someone behaving nutty and irrational, is really if I reframe Dustin's question, mm -hmm. how would you know if this is a chronic tone or an acute tone? Like how would you know if this is a temporary or this is it? This is how they are on pretty much everything. Switch the subject. Switch the subject. Change it. Change it to something else. Uh, make a couple of statements. If you know the tone scale well enough, you can actually just keep talking about different things till you find what do they go into agreement with. What do they find? Now that's an interesting thing. Like, 
Let me give you an example. If you said that the tone that the person most respects, the tone that would have the greatest altitude for a person, is a half tone above where they are. Remember, the furthest distance you can be from them and communicates one full tone. But the tone that they will just admire the most and look up to is a half tone above where they are. When you see relationships between two people, this is not a statement, negative statement, when you see relationships between two people and you have one person really, 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 really admires the other person, if you knew the tone level of either one of them, you could compute what the tone level of the second person was. It's that, it's that precise a thing. So if you spotted this guy here, that guy is a half tone below him for his normal tone. Or the person who's looking up, and I knew his tone, the person he's looking up to is a half tone above him. So when you go into a listing and they're, they're, they're feeling utterly hopeless, mm -hmm. now, where do you place yourself when you're speaking to them to try to... You're usually in a chair. <laughs> I, really, uh, I almost always want to sit. Uh, I'm, not, I'm a big guy and I'm not trying to tower over them. Uh, but to come back to your question, uh, before we go to a house to take a short sale listing, mm -hmm. I want all of the paperwork filled out and uh, either them telling me they absolutely have all of it, all of it together, or they've sent it to us. Mm -hmm. then taking the listing is a formality. So I don't want to get a contract and then try to get someone who will not or cannot gather up the information trying to gather it. We just we can't do it like that. We have to have it. So there are people who are so far south they cannot gather up the papers. They're never going to in this lifetime and we're just we're not going to be taking that listing. We can't activate it, we can, so we can't. Mm -hmm. So you'd have things that you'd want to do to find out is this someone we'll be able to to help. Because in order to help someone, you have to be helping someone who's willing to be helped. Like someone who doesn't want to be helped. I can tell you, you can spend an awful amount of, a, a terrific amount of energy, you can go, but I'm an effective helper. Yeah, well you won't be helping them that much, because they're working the other direction. Right. Now here's the thing. 2.0 on the scale is the make-break point between what I'm going to call north and south. And what I mean by that is people above two are attempting to survive. This is one of those really important things to know. People above two on the scale are attempting to survive. Their actions, thoughts, and activities, and energy, and impulses is in the main headed towards survival. They want to make it better. They're trying to survive. So if the person is above two, if the person is above two on the scale, their actions and activities so forth are headed towards survival. Now, what I'm about to tell you next is something that is startling, fantastic, and important to know. If they are chronically or acutely below two on the scale, their actions, activities, and impulses are not headed toward survival, but in fact are headed toward death and destruction for themselves and others. People who are temporarily below two do stupid, irrational, impulsive, destructive things that could potentially injure them or others. People who are chronically below two will always do impulsive, impulsive, destructive things to injure themselves or others. They are an active liability to have around, and they make life worse for others. So knowing the tone scale can literally keep you alive, assuming that's your goal. In fact, if it was not your goal and your goal was to destroy, you could even use it that way, I suppose. Uh, but that's not what I'm hoping to have happen. But I want to tell you that. Now, remember what I said that the tone that a person would most admire is a half a tone above them. So knowing that, I want to use a horrific example. If you looked at early footage, before he was famous or really in power, as he was on his way to fame, if you looked at early footage of Adolf Hitler 
Triple Gruber was his actual name, but if you looked at footage of Mr. Hitler, what would you think his tone to be? You have to speak German, spot this. Huh? It would be a high tone. Hitler's? Yeah, an incited yeah. crowd and getting excited. Okay, involved. let's not take high tone. Let's, let's like, if you, let, let, if you're thinking correctly of something would be called aesthetics, like the art, like there was a high aesthetic to the Nazis and to the SS. There was an aesthetic factor, like art. Mm -hmm. That's what hooks something. But look at what he talked about. His message was almost exclusively hate and destruction. Mm -hmm. So his tone could not possibly have been higher than 1.5. Anger. But this was someone that the citizens of Germany looked up to. So what would their tone have to have been? One. 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 Fear. Mm -hmm. One. That is exactly what their wow. tone level was. Fear. That's fascinating. Yeah. Their tone level was fear. Their economy was in shambles. Mm -hmm. At the time, inflation was running rampant. Mm -hmm. uh, people could fill, a, literally, a wheelbarrow full of money. And by the time they got to where they wanted to buy some bread, the value had dropped to the point where the person with the bread didn't want to take it. He, he said he'd fix it. He was going to fix it. He was going to fix it. The fact that he was going to murder him, that's a minor issue if you can fix the money problem. But he also pushed the blame on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he just yeah. said this would not be happening if it wasn't for them. Yeah, that. hate and destruction. Now I want to show you. Go to the back of the booklet, right here, fold out. This is an abbreviated version of a chart that Mr. Hubbard made. And this little tool right here is so utterly and fantastically amazing. Uh, and for those who are following this, uh, this, this is in the uh, online version as well. So this, this is a book, but you can take this. This is going to take some time to study this. I'm just going to go through it with you to kind of get you kind of oriented to it. I'll answer any question for you, but what I'm saying is this is something, once you learn what's on this chart, this is an education. This is an amazing education. The far left and far right columns show the numbers on the scale we've been talking about. You see four at the top and 0.1 at the bottom. You have 24 columns going across left to right. You have one is behavior physiology, two medical range, three emotion. These are the names we've been talking about. Four sexual behavior, attitude toward children. Five command over environment. Six actual worth to society compared to apparent worth. Seven is ethic level, eight handling of truth, nine is courage level, ten speech talk, speech listens, this is what will they listen to, what will they talk about, eleven subjects handling of written or spoken communication when acting as a relay point, like what kind of communication will they pass along? Like high tone people pass along a very different type of communication than low tone people. Like what they'll pick to choose to tell relay. Mm -hmm. You could almost, that, that alone will tell you someone's tone level, by the way. Uh, their reality, their ability to handle responsibility, persistence on a given course, literalness of reception of statements. You know, some people, you can make a joke, and it won't matter how absurd it is, they'll take it literally. You could say something literally crazy, and they'll go, hmm, I get it, I see you. Because there's, if they're low-toned enough, anything, they can't differentiate between an obvious joke and a serious statement. It's all the same to them. Everything's big equal deal. Method used by subject to handle others. High tone people. Let us take that first column. It says gain support by creative enthusiasm and vitality backed by reason. That's a really high tone way to handle others. Down a little bit, gain support by creative reasoning and vitality. Down further, invite support by practical reasoning and social graces. Down a little further, careless of support from others, that's at, at, at boredom. Down further, at antagonism, nags and bluntly criticizes to demand compliance with wishes. At 1-5, uses threats, punishment, and alarming lies to dominate others. You get the idea? Yeah. But you, you see, these are different ways people handle. 17, hypnotic level. People who are really low toned are in a, in a light trance all the time. This is why some marketing that's so insane still works. Oh, really, truly, like a TV ad comes on, 
And there are people who says, you need whatever the crap it is. And there are people going, I need it. And they'll go buy it. Right. Call this number right now. Don't miss out on this unbelievable offer. Why don't I miss out on it? And they'll call the number and buy it. Because any, and this is by the way, you find some people when you say something to them, they feel compelled to reject it. This is an attempt to not have to obey you. They're in a hypnotic trance, and all they can do to not follow any incoming instruction is negate. They will attempt to stop you from communicating so that your words don't totally control them. That is why they're doing it. They're in a light trance. They don't know this. This is fixed only by their tone level coming up. Nothing short of it fixes it. It's not an intellectual process, you understand? It, it, like, what causes a person to drop in tone is losing. What causes a person to rise in tone is winning. So you can change a person's tone level by teaching them something that helps them to survive better. Not, not what you teach them. You can say, well, would a learning accounting raise a person's tone? Well, not necessarily, but somebody who's going to be an accountant, it could raise their tone. You understand? Mm -hmm. If somebody, if, if they can see the connection between what they're studying and how it could help them live their life and live a better life, yes, it would raise their tone. Sometimes you'll see people learning some trade or something, go, oh my God, I'm going to know how to fix engines or whatever the hell it is. They're happy. They're happy about it because they can now see a future. I've seen agents, like an agent who learns to actually get customers. All of a sudden, oh my God, well, I can survive in any market. That's right. You understand? It's just that one thing because you go, well, what you want to say to a customer is different in different markets. Which is why some people think, well, marketing doesn't work. Yes, if you run a stupid ad, right, no one calls. It's the same statement. Like, I found something really stupid to say to people, and they wouldn't call me because of it. Yeah, that's a shock. Uh, <laughs> that's alarming. Yeah. Uh, so we have hypnotic level, ability to experience present time pleasure. Low tone people have a really difficult time experiencing pleasure. High tone people can experience lots of pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, your value as a friend, how much others like you, state of your possessions, how well are you understood, potential success, and potential survival. Now here's the thing, there will always be, because of social training and social mechanisms and social machinery, there will be one or two columns that don't line up. But if you go across and you find that someone, yourself or someone else, tends to be at a certain tone, you could go right across and find eight or nine of them. You go, that, there, that's, that's the tone they're at. That's the tone they're at. That's the tone they're at. But you don't have to stay there if you don't want to. Correct. If you know it, what you're looking at. And because you can, you, can, you can just sit there and decide, I'm going to be higher toned. Yeah. It's just that, I mean, I don't want to make it sound complex. Like some people go, well, in order to do that, You'd have to get Sherry to give you uh, 17 years of counseling. No, you don't. If you're stuck in some crap you can't get rid of, call her. Seriously, she's amazing. She's truly amazing. But you can just decide. You can just look and go, I'm not going to be mired down in that crap anymore. You go, well, how do you make that decision? By deciding. You just decide, I'm not doing that, or I'm going to do that. person can just make a decision. And there's been all these, like, people have, well, how do you decide? Just, you know, how do you decide you want a glass of water? Like, really, I'm thirsty. I'm going to have some water. I think I'll put ice cubes in it. And you could take that and you go, well, that's real simple. Yes, yeah, so is the other stuff. You just decide it and you have to stick with it. But you get into some subject. It's different where you want water. And you can decide to get it and go get it so you, nobody thinks, well, I took a big win because I just got the water. But people all the time make decisions they're going to do something. And if I said that the primary purpose of the mind is the correct estimation of effort, I'm going to say that again, the primary purpose of the mind is the correct estimation of effort. If you grossly misestimate the effort involved, you take a loss. Like people come into real estate. 
with no idea of what's involved to be a successful realtor. I mean, I literally remember people going, well, I wanted to have, I saw realtors that drove Cadillacs, I wanted a Cadillac. And I saw them go to lunch, I wanted to go to nice restaurants for lunch and drive a Cadillac. Now, it, they never confronted prospecting. They didn't want to do it. I don't want people saying no to, oh, well, you understand, but they never confronted it, and they never confronted the effort involved, or the amount of effort involved, to become competent. So remained incompetent, and of course failed, and then go, then they're sad about it. But that's really, it's not, you can just decide you're going to do something, it's just that you'd have to know what's involved to pull it off. Like for someone to say, well, what's it take to be a successful realtor? It's a question like, what's it take to become a lawyer successfully? It's the same kind of question. People just don't ask lawyers, well, how is it you just keep going through the classes in law school and then take the bar? But no one asks that question that way because it's so obvious that's what you do. It's so totally obvious you, there isn't some other route to become a lawyer. And once you become a lawyer, there are things you'd have to do to be successful as a lawyer. But there's still the becoming one. Well, to become a realtor in the state of Arizona, it's about a thousand bucks. Like total. I'm talking the licensing fees, joining the association, the whole deal. Uh, people go, well, I am one now. I mean, I, I've talked to agents where they think, that they think they've made some giant commitment to their business because they got business cards printed. They had 500 of them printed, and they're kind of set now. They're sort of waiting for the world to beat a path to their door. Nobody knows they're an agent or cares except their mom and brother. So they have a, they've misestimated the effort required. They've grossly misestimated the amount of effort required. So then they're sort of startled when they don't have money just flowing in. So it does, I don't mean to make it sound complex, but there's any field, I don't care if a person would become a carpenter, an electrician, dentist, it, it, there'd be something to learn, there'd be something to know. There'd be correct technology for any subject, how to do it. And how to be a realtor that does well is not exactly a secret in this day and age. It, it does, it's not like there's some mysterious thing. I, I remember when, uh, when Joanne Calloway in fact, in her book, uh, Clients First, talks about how some woman came up to her and said, well, tell me the secret. And she said, well, we put our clients first. And the woman goes, no, 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 tell me the real thing. What do you do? This is the, the genesis of that, what started them to write that book. But like, this was it. This is, that's what they do. Well, no, I want to know. You've got, come on, come on. Skip, skip the crap was sort of the woman's answer. Like, I know you've got something you're holding back. It was no different than when I'm sitting there asking a guy when he blows out the Palm Pilot. Because he believed it. At least in her case, she had a real answer. <laughs> <laughs> See, he believed, well, look, I've got this. What the hell's that doing? Keeps him work. And he wasn't a very organized guy anyway. So that was what made it even funnier. Anyway, any questions about this? Anything? Anything? Yes. Okay. Can you explain what antagonism is and why is that the make break point? What exactly does that mean? If you said there's a difference between the analytical mind, the one you think with, mm -hmm. and the reactive mind that thinks independently of you and is filled with uh, negativity, pain, and crap. Okay. In the top mind, you can differentiate between very similar statements, ideas, or experiences. In the bottom mind, the computation is only and always A equals A equals A equals A. Anything equals anything equals anything. So the pain that the person experiences is the same as the sound that they heard at the time they got it. So daddy's voice equals getting hit equals I hurt equals I'm upset and I hate you too because you reminded me of what I was thinking of you when you talked. It's all one big glock together crank. So people below are trying to succumb. Like this is why you see when people, like let's, let's just take something as common and as obvious as drunk driving. Okay. What rational person 
seriously. Let's skip the laws. I mean, skip the fact that it's illegal and they'll, take, they'll put you in jail for it. What rational person does anybody ever, when they're not drinking, go, you know what would be a good idea? Mm-hmm. Is to really become drunk out of my mind and get in a car and drive. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not a good idea. It's a really stupid, destructive idea. Mm-hmm. But when someone's out of control enough, it doesn't seem that stupid to them. Mm-hmm. So we'll go back to, so if we talk about a gradient scale, so 2 is on the edge. 2.0 on the scale is where uh, is the make break point. Mm-hmm. And if you think of it in terms of flow, if you think of it in terms of motion, if you took uh, a ball and threw it to someone in antagonism, they would hurl it back at you. If you threw it to someone in anger, that's at 1.5, they would take it and throw it down. They're not interested in communicating. They're not trying to stay in communication with you. If you threw a ball to someone, they take it and throw it down. They're, they're not even going to look at you. Hmm. Like, other than a hateful look. Yeah. So, I, I, am I getting your question? Yeah, answered? no, you are, you are. I'm just, uh, this maybe, you know, I'm just curious. No. So you have, it's a gradient scale. I mean, it's, it's a gradient scale, and, and, and if you look at it, in not, not as an absolute, like as a person surviving. Well, the higher the tone level they are, the higher the tone you are, the better you're going to survive. Because even if you don't know something, like sometimes you'll see people who don't have a lot of knowledge in an area. In fact, brand new agents, this is a classic example, like a new agent working a buyer. If you say, does that new agent have a tremendous amount of knowledge? Nope. Mm-hmm. What they tend to have, though, is a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. Toward, oh my God, I'm going to make a sale. They write a contract, and they're like, I got one. I, oh God, this is exciting. You know, an offer comes in. I'm like, you think I cheer when an offer comes in? You don't. Like, no, we yeah. haven't for many, many years. Uh, yeah. 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 Wake you up once in a while. <laughs> but you understand, it's a big deal. It's a big deal when they're, we're a new agent. So sometimes enough of a, like a person doesn't have a tremendous amount of wisdom and experience, but they've got this exuberance. Sometimes that will carry them quite a ways. It's just that unless they wind up backing it up with some actual knowledge of how things work, they wind up eventually hitting a wall and take a loss where the exuberance alone won't quite work. So I, but it's a gradient scale. And, and what makes a person go high tone, get higher tone, is winning. You could see some young couple. I mean, you know, if you started to say to someone, well, I can show you how to fix your life and make it better. Let's, let's pretend you were going to walk around saying something like that to people. But you walk up to some girl who's finally met the right guy, and she's just on cloud nine. Make it better? Make, you, this, this is it. It doesn't get better. You understand? Mm-hmm. She's they're, they're just like in their, their tone level just soars. They're so happy. But find someone else who had soared, and they have a loss, and it drops. So people move on the scale. And if you can be aware of it, so have you ever seen someone drives kind of close to someone else in traffic and the person who got driven close to was happy and relaxed, maybe listening to music and calm, and the next minute they're just an insane outrage, not not you, don't mean you, (laughs) but you understand. And they're literally screaming some profanity, they're in a car by themselves, Mm -hmm. screaming some profanity at the other person that can't hear them for having driven their car nearby. Now let's talk about tone level. Knowingly or unknowingly matching tone. With me? Mm -hmm. So some event occurs and you can decide I'm going to give complete control to my tone level, to my emotional response toward life, to someone or something in the environment or I'm going to take control myself. You can just decide, well, that did occur, but I'm going to stay here on the tone scale. I'm going to keep, stay happy. Did that make sense? Yeah. A lot of sense, yeah. Any other questions? Anything? I appreciate you listening. You guys have been wonderful. This was the first video. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, this is fantastic. I uh, appreciate you guys being here.